Hello everyone, today we talk about the Longobard settlement in Italy during the 6th century and you will say, what well, Schwerpunkt, we have talked about this multiple times. Well, yes, but not quite in the ones we'll touch today. We've observed a bit like the political situation, the strategic situation, even the geographical situation. Like, it's, it's an interesting chapter um, in history, mostly because, as we'll see now, the, the interpretation of how, however, this thing got down to um, in practice, because that's what we mostly lack, in fact, at this point, in the second half of the 6th century, and that is historiographically generated for a long time, at least in which we are not uh, anymore, also from from a long time, in turn, by the way, uh, an incredible amount of um, misinterpretations, mistakes, misconceptions that are somehow still, however, ingrained, uh, in the general audience and pop culture, let's say, and I think uh, this must be, um, of course, fixed. Uh, That's the reason why I make these videos, and you know uh, from the other ones on this specific uh, time, then we'll move on, right? There is a lot of longer bird history that we haven't covered. In fact, most people stop to the very beginning, right, uh, or the very end of longer bird history without much knowing much about the in between because usually uh, this people is dealt with either in function of of the end alleged end of humanity I made a videos especially to debunk that um, without doubting of the strong Germanic uh, cultural physiognomy that Italy would get uh, from this so actually that's the point right one must habituate oneself to uh, get cognitively, the concept that you can have two things at the same time, right? And simplistic interpretations are, of course, always the easiest, um, except also the the least accurate, to say the least, but not blatantly wrong. And or for the, the end, essentially, uh, Charlemagne, the, the Frankish conquest, etc. So um, a lot gets lost uh, in between. And there are, again, lots of implications about this, because the longer birds are a bit sort of, at least they have sadly become a meme, just like all history. Basically, three-fourths of the videos, history videos published on YouTube are something like, you know, true memes, flags, and superficial interpretation, whatever. Like, mostly what people feel on the base of their prejudices about the minimal references about history they can remember from from school or, you know, playing too many, too, too much video games, which I love playing, but uh, I don't have the time anymore and that I would have played much less if I knew, you know, what better I could do, telling the truth. But just to say that we do, and I will be making videos about this, especially after I reach 10,000, which seems uh, rather near, that the channel will surely make it, about the fact that we are in a post-historical time, as far as the most, let's say, uh, shared, uh, accepted, somehow evaluated level of, let's say, expertise on a given topic, and just even the scale of it, the sense of whatever are people actually interested in, um, and uh, is um, is incredibly again narrow. Uh, it has basically shrunk to sort of general feel whether it sounds right on the base of feelings, emotions, and not on the base of any kind of historical uh, capacity uh, from from anyone. Everybody should have to, to a certain degree, right? And I think that most uh, of the following decades will be spent essentially looking at this aspect, this terrible realization that essentially the existing generations, by different degrees and by accelerating trend, they literally do not have the most elementary knowledge of any kind of history, starting f especially from the one of their own country, which is also probably the, the only very few they ha have heard of, um, and by by consequence to, to any other uh, extent. The longer birds are very powerful, again, as a meme, because they... Uh, represent in this sort of fe generalized feeling the, the epitome of Germanism and a sort of either curse or tragedy or it, it, it really depends right towards humanity 
uh, and so putting an end to to something, to some of it, to to it, uh, depending on you know, what what uh, what opinions again you're looking at, and basically going with this concept. Right, so basically a uh, a, a hatred fueling like either anti-Germanistic or anti-Romanistic kind of dynamic, right? And the, the first mistake is to assume again that uh, that Romanity ended there, and secondly that Germanicity was opposed to it, uh, and not understanding the, the broader imperial and universal meaning of this whole. It's true that the early Middle Ages were uh, a tougher time, and that something had happened, in fact, in late antiquity. But in this regard. The Longobards actually had a very few to do with that in the first place, and this is what uh, prepotently, um, traumatically, and violently hi history, true history, the one actually made by experts, is constantly showing us on the base of basically the entire evidence that we have. And that makes us realize that basically everything that we have sort of interiorized from the sort of weird perception of extremely outdated, I mean literally these were things uh, still shared that were told I think something like five, six generations ago right, not uh, like in the last two or two, like, by, by people who are all dead, right, and that were literally making specific mistakes in the interpretation of the sources, not because they had you know, uh, the good understanding all that but you know we are the degenerates now right actually there is a lot civilizationally that history has advanced like or at least in the pinnacles of the entire mass right as far as understanding this as well as it really was and and so it's very easy to um to slip into the sort of whatever i want to believe it is true especially when a topic like this is um in fact, uh, practically, I, I don't know what's what's the last time you you have actually read any uh, academic work about the Longbirds. I mean, be honest about it, right? And uh, academic work means not the uh, disclosure booklet by you know um, people that talk the longer birds just for identitaristic reasons or the ones that just want to show you that it was all multicultural about it. Um, I don't know how to tell you, but, you know, if you belong to the right, if you belong to the left today, just statistically, you belong to the same level of garbage humanity. Uh, because the entire problem why this level actually exists and beyond left and right is exactly the degeneration at every level of cultural, moral, and especially personal level. And so there is no topic that will make you look better than the tragedy that you are if you still by 2023 don't know about these things because it just means that you literally do not know anything about actual history uh, and that's again why I make this videos and I know that I come off as arrogant and brutal and elitistic and whatever and yeah that's exactly the thing you know and I don't give a damn about that and uh, otherwise I wouldn't make this videos either I'm not here to flatter the audience I'm not here to gain consensus by, you know, like being, ah, I'm a historian, now I'll make vlogs about, I don't know, other, you know, cheap, uh, you know, uh, channels that tell just, you know, not even the ABC right sometimes, and then, ah, I'm the historian, and I will, and I will tell you some sort of second grader notion of history, that that should be my historical insight on it. Now, I'm going to tell you the actual deal, and, and beyond that, I mean, I'm even explaining to you why you do not know these things, which is by far the most interesting thing, I would say, when we talk history. History, again, is not, but history should be separated from anything else, uh, th then there wouldn't be a history. Uh, and, uh, you know, making this kind of this sectar sectorialism, like saying, you know, politics shouldn't get into it, it means that you literally do not know what history is. Not in the sense that it, all that kind of things, and in fact, the religion of the lesser people believes in, such as the history is written by the victors, uh, or that, you know, there is this conspiracy that want it, it, the, the fact that people do not know history is imminently and actually and exclusively on them as individual people, right? It, it doesn't matter, you know, what's your background, if you couldn't get an education, um, if, you know, you, you, you were brought up in a diseased condition, 
there is in 2023 no excuse for not knowing these things and exploiting them just because you don't know about them. And I'm not referring, of course, about my audience in general, right? I'm sure that lots of people subscribe without even knowing what, what the hell I'm even talking about and do not understand why I talk about these things before videos like this. But again, that's why I need to do so, right? And uh, in general, I hope uh, to come off as somehow uh, reasonable in this. Now, the myth busting that today we will touch about the Longobard settlement in Italy is this sense of um, somehow emergentious, precarious uh, militarization and somehow seclusion of uh, especially the, the Longobards from the Romans. We have already talked at length actually about this in, in the last video I made about the Longobards. There is a playlist you can check. But specifically, again, to to the settlement about the settlement dynamics, right? Where and how did the Longobards settle in Italy? Like in places like not just geographically. Again, there is a video made about that too. That we know more or less, right? Throughout the chronology, where did the Longobards settle first and expanded in, etc., across the peninsula? But also, why in that way? Um, and in which relation to, especially the local population, is sing the single most important thing of all, to general, you can't say foreign threats, um, sometimes within the same peninsula, and also within the most political space, that is especially the cities, that uh, far from dying in longer times actually became the centers of power, as they had, of course, continuously been throughout the, the the previous period and would remain throughout all Italian history. So um, this this is exactly the point. Right? There, there should, we should abandon the concept that the Longobard occupation of Italy was some sort of, um, let's say, traumatic event that put things upside down as far as the political and social balance of the peninsula, especially after the Gothic War already was. Right. This is not to say that the Longobards literally did something nasty, but compared to the Gothic War, right, that's you know something you know you, you can't see in relative terms. This is literally realizing that Longobards were following the on the, the steps of the same gods that had settled in Italy, as we know, in very orderly and effective and productive way. Um, that in fact entered a country that. Uh, as we've seen, was essentially supporting this mechanism. Like the, the Longobard, the, there is no um, anti-Longobard um, uh, sentiment among registered among the, the Italian population during this thing. Uh, there was a war that, of course, highlighted the contrast between the Longobards and the Byzantines. And I made a video also about, especially the Gothic um, siege of Rome. Um, in which we highlight that the Byzantines here are not the Romans as the Romans that lived in Italy, right? And I made, surprise, surprise, lots of videos explaining why it is absolutely fair uh, and right to use the term Byzantine, and especially in this case, right? Here we're talking about essentially an, an Italian, um, especially with the Longobards, you can't really start talking about an Italian population, an inside, and a Byzantine uh power that was essentially not extraneous to it, especially in some cities, mostly the ones that had been strongly influenced by Hellenic uh, culture since classical times on the coast of southern Italy, but that had in fact um, a very few to do with the overwhelming majority of the Italian population, in, essentially in the Romano-Italic continental uh, background. Uh, that was definitely not uh, a savage one was actually one that had laid literally the the fabric of what we still recognize across Western Europe, from Spain to to Britain, from from, from France to to in fact to Italy and other parts. Um, the actual divide that existed on the base of that still today between Western Europe and say the the Balkans, say southeastern Europe. Um, and the um, and, and say that another world that was more influenced by the uh, Hellenic tradition, the Byzantine one, etc. This is core to understand. 
because we know that generally speaking things in the West as far as the Romano-Germanic integration, cooperation, synergy work pretty well and that the Longobards were no exception and that yet again there is an enormous um, sort of confusion about this topic mostly for reasons that I hinted at before essentially that there are Teamed, counterposed teams of peoples, and in fact, it did exist in the 19th century, as far as, the, for example, Italian and German historians were going. Uh, there, there was all a problem. Like it was, of course, as say Western nations already at the time academically they understood that it was a symbiosis, that there was, of course, a shared past, etc. But still, there was um, on the base of a legitimate of of good faith, actually. Right, even authors like Manzoni, for example, dedicated think about the Adelkis, uh, dedicated themselves to recover. Like this history had never actually been studied seriously up to mostly the nineteenth century. That's where we found a real uh let's say uh quality, right? Academic quality that is still regarded today. You can't quote a work for the time still being um relevant about it. But that had legitimately uh made mistakes about the interpretation of the sources that we will partly explain now. The stereotyping, the dramatization of the dynamic, especially again in, in, uh, in terms of the relation between Latins and Germans, something that was based properly on, a, on an error, on historical miscalculation, a uh, lack of proper philological means, and properly all the studies that eventually developed on these topics um, later on, with with great precision, again, nobody believes those things from at least a couple of generations, way before, by the way, uh, 1968, it has basically nothing to do with this, that actually, in part, paradoxically, even reinforced the, instead, the, um, the, eth- the concept of ethnic divide, even when, uh, because that's what essentially even uh, critical race theory today does, uh, so it, it has nothing to do like denying nationalism as um, a favor to leftism. Nationalism is born as a radical leftistic terrorism, and as you know, this is a video about the imperial, uh, the uh, a channel say, about the imperial Catholic tradition. That I realize that, of course, m- most people are and must at this point be unaware of, for obvious reasons. Um, that is far way more right wing, but except for the right reasons, right? That people still confuse by thinking that I don't know, nationalism is the on- the only escape from leftism. It, it, essentially, buying a leftism in order to to fight leftism it doesn't nationalism the first step towards socialism for obvious reasons of flattering of of average flattering um, and mass fort estate standards that are the ones for which this, this ideologies were born in the first place and in an anti in a purely anti traditional fashion. And uh I don't think you can pass a an exam of contemporary history if you you know, even at the beginning of of your uh, even in in school actually, but uh, say first year of university if you actually believe otherwise. In any case, uh, that's how However, what we also have to deal with, and surely we'll have to make lots of videos explaining a lot of what was going on, especially in this hinterland, from a also from an agricultural point of view. Like there is all, um, in fact, a work of civilization spread. For example, think about Benedictine uh, monasteries, the a completely different um, approach that the papacy now began to have towards um, this the, the, the peasantry um, and in, in the evangelization of Europe and again yet another topic that I still haven't found a single person first of all treating but secondly doing in the right way uh, on a medium like YouTube for example but you have my medieval society and a rural history kind of playlist that explains part of this stuff um, so I think an important part to start from is that say it's to conceptualize certain things the the first one is that the situation determined by the first impact of the longer bird invasion slash settlement um, was uh, without any doubt uh, transient right it was literally just these guys arriving and settling and in most cases remaining where they were right so 
whichever could be the problem of organizing this this system uh, came definitely after the Longobards had already decided together with the Roman population and likely even in uh, in agreement with the same imperial authority because it, it, this is one of the problems of documentation at the time. It's not explicit, but I, I think there is no doubt by this point that the Byzantines had actually agreed for the Longobards to settle and that the thing just um, got out of hand later. So this would all came later, right? But on the basis of what Longobards had already been established like and with relations that were basically the same uh, of the one of any other uh, federatus that had uh, been settled in that way before. So the political and social relations within uh, the the new king, the new realm that let's remember was not consolidated until essentially the eighties of of the sixth century, uh, and after a great struggle within the same Longobards, right? We will see this all in in another video. Then there is this is before Rotary's edict, so all before a certain level, surely, of, of mm, political and territorial level of uh, control that the Longobards still had to consolidate by some degree in a, in a unitary fashion, as a, as a unitary kingdom, but still as um, being, first of all, very aware of the fact that they were a, a unitary people, in spite of the fact ex that exactly that shared identity entailed a level of autonomy that had still, however, to be curbed in order to essentially put the uh, resources in common in order to make a kingdom work, right? which is a completely different thing that basically the Germans never had um, before settling in, in Roman land. Uh, and, uh, and that would obviously take time, especially when the Byzantines and the Franks are trying to knock you out uh, in the process and you know uh, other quite nice things are going on um, in the meanwhile. Right? Uh, so we can say uh, that the settlement of the Longbirds, per se, as far as the internal dynamics of at least the territory that they already controlled, were much smoother, as we have observed, than uh, it's usually believed. The, the greatest problem is that from the Longbird side, from, for a relatively long time, say a ridiculously short time compared to, to especially the rest of Europe, especially the central, the northern one, is um, it's not no, meaning that uh, it, it's absolutely normal, even in the country that would still continue to have the highest level of literacy uh, uh, in the world, uh, spread among the population to have such a few amount of information, especially from the Longbird side of the aisle. Uh, there is no conspiracy. This is just normal by the level, the normal degree of documentation that this level of, of civilization really had. So, needless to say, as I was saying before, that there is, there was at least to some point, there is still to this time to some, to some at least to some degree, right? But this enormous and extremely long historiographical issue. Uh, about how the Longbirds concretely settled like, right? Uh, and yet, again, the greatest uh, obstacle for, say, an historical insight, and, um, and, not, and especially, but not only, for example, in Italy during the so-called Ris Risorgimento, and so the, uh, that phase of essentially Italian nationalism still in, you know, you know in that 19th century eco, of the spotting of the death, the, the fate, of course, from the Italian side, it's the thing they looked at the most, of the, say, quote, defeated Romans, right? Um, which was all tense to establish if, with uh, the invasion, the Longburn invasion, the Romans would have been deprived or not, or less, of their liberty. Right, and this is actually very important conceptually because it's not just about the, you know, how these people were seen, or how they were juridically disciplined initially, but what about whether they had um, preserved or not their landed property, 
this is an enormous uh, issue because it's not much again what concretely happened because it's obvious that most Romans kept living exactly in the same way they had always been living at that point and actually and probably re received even a, a greater uh, room to maneuver right socially speaking as far as uh, the average person w was concerned right uh, but it, it's important from a political juridical institutional point of view to determine how did the, the longer birds um, eventually developed their concept of political and territorial rule as a people that at some in a couple of generations would have uh, included also large swaths of the Roman of the previously Roman population uh, and so to discipline the relation with with other people and this is um, um, let's say an issue that as we will see in in other videos hopefully there is uh, that doesn't have um, much consistency because whichever this problem uh, could have arisen uh, and been settled like um, what we see from in the later centuries of Longbird history is something that does not suggest practically any form of uh, loss of liberty again on the contrary on an empirical basis you find even technically that the individual liberty had increased uh, for reasons that by the way are not even just like the Longbirds decided so right uh, let's remember this the Latifundium had already been destroyed during the Gothic War so the lo if if it had depended on the Longbirds and they had let's assume found an intact Latifundium they would have believed exactly how the, the Franks did how the Goths did how the Vandals did that is to say to keep this massive Latifundia and creating a sort of feudal system uh, with this powerful oligarchies clashing against one another the Longbirds uh, because everybody does that, right? We do not have a people that magically arrives and finds the Latifundium and says, well, here, this is a well-organized large estate system that it, we can use as uh, aristocracies to, to rule large swaths of this territory more effectively, etc. Let, let's tear it down, right? Because everybody's free or, or whatever, right? No, right? That would have not happened. Um, and so the the longer birds just, and they were actually benefited in, in great, uh, in a great, by a great deal actually of governability because paradoxically the aforementioned Latifundian system as the Visigoths and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the Merovingians perfectly exemplify actually created massive and a radical divide exactly at an elite level because they began all these massive clientels began to, to fight against one another as different chunks of this enormous territories that didn't help, of course, um, to preserve what in Italy, as you understand, was already very advanced, that degree of very high uh, level of civil development, of actual um, individual liberty in spite of, of what um, late antiquity had been. There is no doubt that the colonists lived as serfs de facto, etc. But basically, in no other part of the world, this was also true. So actually, this was possibly still the highest um, again, uh, level of liberty you could find out there. The per capita wealth, as I often say, was was still the highest in the world, even throughout the early Middle Ages in Italy, right? Uh, in, uninterruptedly from Roman times to up to the late 17th century. So this this aspect must be taken in consideration because still the level, for example, of urbanization of uh, the communities that inhabited there, and surprise, surprise, in fact, the the Longbird settlement there and, and government there, of course, dramatically helped the unity of this kingdom. And yes, I will say it at nauseam. Yes, lots of people still believe that the Longbird kingdom was all split in duchies. If you think this, I urge you to read any, any book published in the last 70 years about Longbird history and to understand uh, that this is factually untrue uh, 
um, and that the only level of, let's say, uh, division that could exa exist between the various duchies was, first of all, on a regional level, like very far away and large ones that still, however, recognized throughout their entire history once the kingdom was established, the crown of Pavia, and never seceded because there is no such event in, in Longobard history. Um, and this stemmed dramatically from the level of, um, let's say, of civilization meant in, in the balance between, um, in fact, public power and individual liberties that instead was completely absent to, at least in, 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 in relation to this, for example, in places like Go, uh, where wealth was in the hands of very few people. Um, all the rest basically remained... Um, again, under that lord, whomever he was, in that region, and that region, say, tried to keep on ex escaping from the pressure of others, and f major wars and destructions occurred. This is obviously also connected to the broader development of civilization in Europe, of course, goal, it doesn't matter how the, the single most um, extremely successful example of Romanization outside of Italy was still goal. Right, uh, Merovingian Gaul has essentially a a private public culture. There is no such thing like a state as a public culture, or whatever. It's purely a private system based on a dynastic uh, power connected to this chosen house that uh, fundamentally has created an empire, not a um, not a not just a kingdom as such, um, and. There was an accomplishment there because, of course, Gaul could achieve that under the Merovingians because the Gallo-Roman system was preserved, because also the conversion of the Franks was very smooth, and so there was a great substratum of Romanity that helped forming that power as well. But in the case of the Longobard, this was even bigger, and it actually revived part of that sense of civic, municipal pride and uh, strength that actually characterizes also the, the Italian communes, as we've seen, that were uninterruptedly from, from Romano-Germanic times convinced of the fact that they were not just freemen, but noblemen. As freemen, which is the, the actual spot-on ancestral, both Roman and Germanic idea of freedom. Um, and uh, that had, of course, all the uh, moral and... Uh, and uh, material capacity to to show right throughout all the rest of the Middle Ages. So this is um, uh, an incredibly uh, overlooked aspect that uh, I must say it, it, it's not, in fact, so so famous even per se. But uh, it's been rediscovered to a, a clamorous degree that. Uh, basically shatters most of what we thought about the, the Middle Ages, also in function of what we thought things had changed like from, from ancient times. Um, so, um, the last centuries of Longobard history, which are the majority of Longobard history, um, given the fact that, again, the, the situation stabilized firmly, like, in part already, as far as these institutional matters are concerned, from the late, the very late sixth century, but to say, from from the early seventh century, we can basically say, well, okay, like now the, the cake has um, cooled off, and it basically will remain this one. And the Longobards at that point had the upper, and in Italy, the same Byzantines recognized what they had conquered, and they would be eaten up by the Longobards uh, gradually. Almost and almost completely until the Carolingian conquest that still incorporated uh, the Longobard kingdom as a peer to the Frankish one, and like any other nation that was conquered by the Franks, because um, this was uh, ahead, far ahead in terms of civilized development um, compared to the Franks that desperately needed that in order to prevent their privatistic system, as it still would happen later, to, to collapse, right? Um, and attaching even the imperial uh, dignity to the Italic kingdom, not to the Frankish one. Now, um, our knowledge of Italian history of the 6th, say, to 8th century 
tells uh, tell us obviously that things uh, went pretty much in these terms that um, the situation in the late sixth century was of course not the same of the seventh and of the eighth so uh, whichever was the military nature of the Longobard conquest that, let's repeat it, didn't find any resistance practically, aside from garrisons, right? The the Imperial Mobile Army was not there, and especially was not sent there in the moment the, the Longobards crossed. We do not have any signal from Constantinople, and that's the reason why you think it was all planned, and they um, and it made a lot of sense, because creating a sort of a buffer state in northern Italy to parry the Byzantines from the very dangerous Merovingian expansionism that would have later on in Frankish history in fact reached Italy anyway under the Carolingians was a great concern. Um, but we do not have evidence of destructions connected to the Longobard conquest. The Longobards obviously preserved what they conquered, it, that basically simply opened the gates to them, was not defensible um, by, the, by the Byzantines, and the Romans weren't seeing the Longobards here as anything worse than the Ostrogoths, and again, all the, the, uh, the Germanic peoples that had always been functionally uh, settled through the hospitalitas mechanism, and that were actually boosting even the in fact, the military defense of the land that at some point, for example, at the end of the Gothic War was exposed to Frankish Alemannic raids up to southern Italy just because there was nothing left uh, of the Goths or at least not enough to put up a, a resistance right, to defend the land. And, and remind us that the Byzantines didn't really care much about Italy as such, if not the south uh, or at least the areas that were more... Uh, deeply Romanized. It's true that actually Cisalpine Gaul had some of the largest cities in the empire at the time. And that tells you again, yes, this was the terrible early Medi Middle Ages, etc. But how terrible was it, right? If if cities like Milan or, or Verona, etc. were still some of the largest of the empire, right? This is... Uh, and the Longobards ruled from there, right? How s terrible was the system anyway? The Byzantines cared about Rome. You cannot have a Roman emperor called as such, that doesn't control Rome, right? Uh, and uh, that alone justified the entire Justinian and recon uh, reconquest that, in my opinion, was also very logical and obvious uh, and also successful, right? Uh, say, the, the plague, all what happened later is not like, well, since there was this risk, uh, they should have not carried out their conquista because it was better just to remain in your shell, uh, etc. Well, no, this is, I don't know how you think the world works, uh, how you think that a material practical advantage comes from it. This was a clamor success, um, and uh, any thought otherwise is essentially isolationism, which I think is one of the first indicators of the deeply rooted cultural inferiority of a people. Um, they had the power, and as such, they used it, because that's the only thing that makes sense uh, in the world, right? Let alone, like, you have to, to be able to use it in the first place, which is another thing, right? But here we're talking about players that were also acting in an incredibly different um, condition anyway. Um, so, the longer settlement... Uh, as we've seen also in the previous vid uh, video about the uh, the idea of the, the myth of the end of Romanity and whatever, there are these two, this couple of, say, of, of very tormented passages by Paul the Deacon that, as you know, was writing in, in the 8th century and had to make sense of Longobard history as a Longobard, as a clergyman, as d describing a situation that was very distant um, from his own uh, but still had to make a sort of let's say providential sense regarding the and so highlighting even the contrasts between especially the um, say the, the, the moment of Arianism and one of uh, Catholicization and, and so on so here it, it's a lot of stuff and I explained it in the other video I will not uh, repeat myself, but that 
is important because it's literally the only thing we have practically uh, together with a few other hints about what the situation was and those passages do not really um, they're very simple passages to say something like you know the most powerful Romans were kicked out or they, they left um, and of course it doesn't tell about the average people and we've seen dramatically that basically the entire institution mostly the church that held um, control there aside from, from the secular one that now we're the long birds still were you know, in good shape, they, they were actually uh, saying nuts to the same Byzantines that tried to reach them <laughs> while they were under the long birds. They, they were working, they had representatives on their own, there is there are Roman names, there are, there is a, we do not have, of course, any evidence of long bird persecution um, of, of, of the Catholic, the overwhelming Catholic majority, by the way. So time people come and say, ah, oh, but... Uh, the Longbirds were so many, the, in Italy there were, I don't know, there was one million people, there were multiple, some at least millions of people in Italy. It, the Longbirds counted um, at most like a 3% of the entire population. You can argue that, of course, uh, some areas were in the hands of the Byzantines, but the myth that Italy had gone basically deserted um, is a myth that is, is notoriously, in fact, fabricated on these... Uh, uh, let's say uh, hyperboles that of course are to be contextualized in all the for mo most often the hydrographic uh, eschatological sort of apocalyptic language um, used by the sources what they say but there is no evidence of a dramatic um, say uh, of a deprivation of basically the entire population in this place no this is not what happened in a major regional uh, reality like especially the most what would go on as being the most developed uh, in, in qualitative terms um, in, uh, in in the Mediterranean and that uh, continuously shows the you know the the, the well say the, the, the important well-being of the cities of this what would evolve as a cent essentially a, son a centralized government by early medieval standards under the long birds that again, kept being productive, we see the wealth, uh, we see uh, the people, we see this kinetic force that is also something that is much less documented elsewhere in Europe and nobody makes the case that this catastrophistic picture of, I don't know, there were as many Longbirds as Romans, this is not historical. Nobody, uh, there is no scientific evidence of this, there is no historical work that shows this. Uh, even the most catastrophistic um, measures say something that Italy had some million inhabitants when there were likely several, and there is no proof of the contrary. And it's not strange, uh, you know, mathematical, um, you know, magic tricks calculating, I don't know how many people there were in Rome, whatever, that has any sense, like under any political, demographic, social, historical, economical level. Um, and it just betrays uh, an incredibly poor uh, knowledge of the 6th and 7th century, um, and w which you can immediately sense from certain on, uh, on YouTube how many videos are there in depth about Longbird history, uh, and uh, search how many there were instead. How was Rome, you know, uh, when it was depopulated, when it fell, right? And look at the number, look at the proportion, and then reflect about the psychiatric conditions of the people that have created that proportion. And ask yourself why they wanted to hear that. Because those videos, in case you don't know, are designed specifically for, for fishing, like what the audience believes, even though um, it's, um, it, it's quite unhealthy, uh, to say the least, not just from a historical uh, point of view. So, to make the long story short, whatever happened technically, in that late 6th century, uh, during the invasion, shortly afterwards, uh, during, let's say, in the world organization of the system, whatever, from a strategic point of view, that the garrisons, etc., we can make just hypotheses, right? We can know much better about the rest of Longbird history in the following centuries. They really tell us very interesting things. For example, as far as our military history series is concerned, like the... Um, you know, the, the Longbird defenses of Italy are quite fascinating uh, to, to, 
to observe. They're well, relatively well documented. We have an idea of how the, the system worked, etc. And we can, um, in part, look at, um, however, the the logical consequence that we see in this later period to to say uh, remain uh, certain that the, the general characteristics of the Longobard settlement in Italy is frameable, at least on the the, the medium term, uh, in in ways that we can draw some some information from. So one of the most pressing problems um, that we have in part already seen, uh, and this was true for, for Italian historiography, um, is represented uh, by the the where, uh, other than just the how, the Longbirds settle. Because there is, again, the simple story of the settlement that, as I was saying before, we know of, we, we can, we have... A, a fairly comprehensive timeline uh, and we know, I don't know, that this part of the Adriatic littoral was settled, I don't know, in between the spirit, whatever. But as you understand, uh, what happened at the beginning was not just like a paradox game, right? There are lots of people moving, lots of war bands uh, roaming around, there are some uh, situations to, to exploit and of course those are almost untraceable, right? And they still did affect, importantly, uh, our understanding, for example, from an archaeological point of view, of what could be Longaburn and could be not, uh, during the, the broader process of the people's settlement. Meaning what? That if I find some, I don't know, structure built at some time around that point, if I know that that place is was in the hand of the Longbirds as opposed to to the Byzantines, well, I I have something there. At least if I'm so concentrated on trying to find the differences and whether the Longbirds lived, uh, I don't know, in somewhere else compared to the Romans in in the process, how catastrophic was this change, whatever, um, and uh, that's in fact not much. Uh, uh, of an approach, right? First of all, um, regarding the the say habitual sense that this was a period of, of decadence, it's practically impossible to connect this directly to the Longobard invasion, right? Don't get me wrong. Again, in, in the frontier with the Byzantines, etc., we do not uh, we know what there were the, the destructions. There were again, scorched earth strategies from both sides, by the way, so we know that in a fairly precise way, I don't know, the destruction of the walls of Brescello at some point, or the ones of, of, of Genoa after the conquest. These were precautions taken in just for not necessarily, for example, in, in the latter example, after say, the war was over, in a broader sense, so mostly for reducing even the possibility, for example, some of these communities could escape from control, that that, that this that it would take yet another siege to, to seize a thing like that. Um, and we do not see any of this in the Longobard occupied areas, as it would be normal. I mean, there was a broader decadence that had been the plague, there had been the war before the Longobard invasion, and we, we see that that was disastrous. But we do not see the longer birds act adding damage, if not when they were actually engaged in warfare with the Byzantines, but when the, the frontier had already stabilized. Let's say half of Italy was already in the hands of the longer birds, and there we do not find a destruction. Um, and we, we see that essentially uh, in, at the frontier with the Byzantines. That also created problems, because again, at some point the Byzantine and Frankish armies invaded the Po Valley, for example. And the Longbirds uh, entrenched themselves in in the well fortified um, cities uh, of the north, and you know that's they managed also to to prevent uh, the, the the destruction of their kingdom at that point. They after that nobody tried it anymore. Um, and one general prejudice that existed regarding the Longbird lifestyle is again the idea the Longbirds were 
yes, uh, a people that had been living now for centuries in, in Central Europe, they had a markedly, and I made a video about this, Scandinavian outlook. Um, they surely had other elements within them that had collected along the way, but they're most, they were mostly and unequivocally Germanic. They had been barely Romanized before, if not in Pannonia, it was not exactly one of the most, um, you know, um, prosper examples of, of, of uh, say, Roman survival by, by that time, uh, by, say, the, the Byzantine uh, alliance and things like that. They had already fought, fought in the Byzantine army. They had already been in Italy uh, exactly um, under Narses, etc. But they were somehow wild, and so also archaeologically, we must think they just lived as, I don't know, primitive Scandinavians. Uh, and uh, so, in a way that would have been allegedly, in, in, say, incompatible from a cultural point of view with the, the high level of uh, Italic development. Uh, and this would centrally affect, as a prejudice, the relation between the Longobards and urban life. Which, as we'll see now, doesn't make actually um, any sense. Uh, first of all, because we do have narrative and documentary sources that clearly speak of the nature of cities as the centers of civile and military power within the kingdom throughout all Longobard history. So nobody realizes what kind of uh, savages this, this Longobards should have been. Uh, and even if they had been, why, say, assuming to be primitive, mean like not being able to exploit a situation like that? There is the sense that the Longobards were primitive, brutal monsters come out of, again, of uh, the most uh, underdeveloped places of, uh, of Northern Europe. And I'd say the Ostrogoths instead were so much, so civilized, right? Because instead, you know, living in, uh, in the Pontic steppe and in... Uh, uh, in in the in, in Illyricum and just sending some some king uh, to to be fostered at the court of Constantinople and after these people had been under the hands for 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 generations like you know would, would be that that whole mark of civilization. These of course were in their own way, of course developed peoples and surely the longer birds had had much less romanization and the people like the gods in general. But they aren't radical differences that would alter, for example, the interaction with a country like Italy that, again, also in spite of the destruction, was, was fundamentally the same. Actually, again, it was easier for the Longobards to, to seize control uh, of the, the true centers of power because they were really the ones governing now in the absence of the Roman elites that instead ruled the country uh, in parallel with the Ostrogothic military um, throughout all the, the period before, and actually creating some friction, and even the uh, actually the just in, at least providing the 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 pretext for uh, Justinian and conquest, right? But it's the same country. Doesn't matter how decayed this is by some degree. That again, people tend to make more catastrophistic than what it was, but the system works in the same way. Right, there is land, uh, there are cities that keep on working, there is a great road network, the, the, the place is has a mild weather, it has good crops, it is still substantially populated. Um, in spite of all, so why would the Ostrogoths or the Longbirds behave that differently towards the city? Right, it doesn't make any sense. Right, um, so somebody like at least i'm talking about actual historiographers now i'm not making the name but originally let's put it in this way there was this idea that the longbirds were too were too barbaric right so they just occupied militarily the cities as a sort of paranoid um people that had to be suspicious of the romans whatever in, in part this may be true in the sense that of course uh, the longbirds were the 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 staunch minority of the Italian population that was, of course, still technically uh, subject to the Byzantines and that could always intervene. So there was a, surely a situation of, of, of tension initially because uh, 
again, it was possible still, as we have seen for, for the Byzantines and other peoples who tried to dislodge the Longobards. There had to be, even more for this reason, some Longobard Roman connection that would make things work. It, it is true that, that say, the Germanic warrior was essentially paranoid, like most warriors in their in the individualism and in pride. If you look at Longobard art uh, before settling in Italy and being gentrified by some more sensual Mediterranean forms, you see what was in the head of these people, like uh, primordial snakes eating humans, scattering the limbs everywhere. I mean, they, they literally lived in a world that was that, because again, the barbaricum was a living hell, right? And that's the reason also why these peoples were moving the hell out of that. Um, and uh, of course, they counted on this wealth to be preserved, especially in a time like the second half of the 6th century, where everybody was faring pretty badly, right, uh, everywhere. Uh, so demographic or agricultural resources were not something you had uh, to kid with, right? Um, and the, historiographically, this sort of military occupation was in the absence of, as we will see archaeologically speaking, things tell tell us something again. When after things were said a bit more in depth, all and and all the hints, all the pieces were put together. We see another picture, but. Since this takes time and generations historiographically, you had this approximation. Well, at the beginning, Longwards occupied the cities in a military way, whatever that means. Um, and this thing, well, took some time after that. They began to live among the other people. And basically, this was the, the literal explanation, right? There was no other better info provided on how the, the, the system had practically worked. Um, so people remained just blocked on this image, right? That is uh, just guessed, by the way, that it is formed in function of the age of invasion uh, or at the, the latest in the immediately uh, later, in fact, uh, decades. And that um, some have, uh, at least in the older days, were trying to project without any change, on the 7th and the 8th century. Because, again, everybody wanted to highlight the sort of, oh my god, it's the end of Rome, the Germans have taken over, this terrible thing, it was this enmity between them or whatever. So the beginning of a military occupation naturally implies the existence of separated quarters for the Romans and for the Germans. The latter would have occupied the most important places of the old Roman city, say the forum, the public palaces, the baths, uh, the amphitheater. And what is fascinating um, about this is that, again, Italy has a brutal continuity in the infrastructural um, usage of, of these buildings, like the, the function did change at a point, say amphitheaters could be fortified. The Colosseum, notoriously in Rome, uh, even though we're not talking about Longobard Italy, but you know, it was throughout the entire Middle Ages a sort of castle. Um, the Forum, again, the, the places where you would gather forces, also more largely, public palaces. I mean, this, this is something that until Carolingian times was, was imagined from somebody coming from Central Europe, like having palaces in stone. And massive ones, right? The, the palatium is something that remains deeply ingrained. It was true uh, already as an achievement of conquest by uh, in Ostrogothic times under Theodoric and the beautiful um, buildings that he erected, by the way, in the Roman way. The, um, the, this, the solidity of public power embodied by that, that were literally garrisoned, occupied by, by the German militias, etc. The baths how this worked. We know, even in the Duchy of Spoleto, I made a video on this uh, in, in the heart of the uh, Apennines, we know that there were bats working at the time, under the longers, they had, as it had happened in, in Roman times. And consider that our information is so patchy and sketchy that it doesn't like 
if, if we know that for Spoleto, God knows how many bats were keeping on working. By the way, the myth that it, even throughout the Middle Ages, generally speaking, people didn't bath or bats were rare, whatever, it's, it's a complete myth. Um, in any case, these were the most important uh, structures that were there. Right? This hadn't magically disappeared or you know, there was a nuclear weapon that destroyed everything at some point. This stuff was still there. Right? Paradoxically, this stuff was dismantled later on in the Middle Ages, in the modern age, just because these places just expanded, right? And um, the material were was used for other purpose. Uh, the just urbanistically things expanded, and older structures were taken out. It wasn't much, of course, of, of a culture of say the, the preservation of of cultural legacy, like it started appearing uh, during humanism uh, and so on. Then, of course. Um, there was also the strictly military infrastructure, like it's obvious that the Longbirds would um, control the most strategically uh, favorable places, classically the areas around the gates. This is something that continues throughout the entire Middle Ages. If you look at Italian warfare throughout all, say, I don't know, the, the communal period, you, you find that basically the entire strategy revolved about occupying these this things during coups. Uh, uh, blitzes, etc., and um, and we do not know, by the way, here what the Romans were doing, because in Gaul, for example, we find a big deal of uh, Roman militias serving n- next to the the Merovingian Franks um, and and their military system that was still pretty active. Um, and we see throughout all the, the Middle Ages that normally, uh, even late antiquity, we've seen it many times, the bishops were normally entrusted with the organization of a, of a watch, right, of a, uh, of a garrison, whatever. It's obvious that when the Longbird took over, they tendentially preferred to control the thing themselves, but they surely would have not... Um, you know, just refused uh, a support from the local uh, citizenry that was already habituated. This is the important thing that by by law, just socially, administratively, that to defend their own city walls, and and that was also a significant uh, military potential, especially for the 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 defense of a city. That let's remember that the Longbirds had entered in without fighting, so it's not that there weren't forces that could oppose themselves to the Longbirds. But we do not know anything about this. And the fact that we do not know anything doesn't mean that there could have not been an integrated cooperation since the very early days, especially considering that these cities were technically entrusted to the Longbird government, even by imperial delegation. If the, the, the in fact, the, the guide, the, the agreed settlement had actually occurred like that, um, so you find, even if you read that, that's why at the beginning I said what what, uh, what you read, because uh, it's easy to find in, I don't know, an unspecific, um, say, uh, publication, whichever it is, about, even of a certain tone, about, say, Longobard art or Longobard society or whatever, talking, say, about other times, other periods, saying, well, still, at the beginning, the Longbirds settled in a militarized way, and they leave just... It, it, it's just, they all repeated each other, because they're repeating that kind of original uh, trope, and they do not move from that, also because they th- there is no evidence, right? And since they're not experts, or they do not care, they maybe just don't really mind about this dynamics in the first place, they still keep on... Um, repeating what they find from from other places. There, there is sometimes, um can say amateurialism just per se, but don't think again that even scholars are, in absolute terms, are that uh, sensitive to to actual, you know, serious work. Let's put it in this way, f- as far as this contextual information has to, uh, is concerned. There is even a paradox that when archaeological finds about these first Longbird groups, of course, were found in, you know, well-documentable places, after all, considering the times. 
uh, like uh, the Italian cities, um, some uh, altars uh, began to uh, ethnicize, uh, in a sense, this, this settlement. Right? They wanted to overly stereotype the somehow the barbaric character of this people. Right? Normally, we see how do we track the longbirds in this context. Well, you you have a pretty say you have all different basins of material culture, right? You can't often distinguish them that much. I mean, in Central Europe, the, the longbirds, for example, have the same material culture um, outlook of, say, the, the Thuringians or, or even the, the Franks, right? They all belong to this sort of um, group that, that looks, that has certain characteristics and more or less displays the same, uh, the same uh, finds and it's different even to distinguish it from one another. Then you find a place like Italy, of course, it's different, right? So when in, in the first generation or, or or two of the settlement, you can spot, right, on the base of comparison, etc., something you can date, right, to a certain time that is obviously allergen, and you know that from history, uh, that that's the moment in which the, all, the longer birds settled, where you you look uh, at mostly cer it's ceramics, uh, arms, jewels, that's basically it. And you can say, well, you can be legitimately sure that these are the longer birds, right? Um, and some aspects, for example, uh, semi-interred um, wooden huts, uh, the, that, by the way, were to be found through uh, traces, right? Mostly some holes for the uh, beams uh, when uh, were found, were excavated in places like Brescia, Como, and Ancedonia specifically, and Luni. These were interpreted to be, even though we do not actually have the the entire picture of the of the building, as a sort of northern European model. Right, that's uh, that the archaeologists call Grubenhäuser. So the sense that for a few finds you have systematized this general idea that, that this completely different people arrived into Italy and somehow was all different and began to still build different things because they're habituated like before doesn't actually sound very convincing. But it was a fur, right? And people said maybe well, maybe those who built that were Romans, right? You understand what I mean? But they said, oh, well, since it has these characteristics, for whichever reason, they must have been the longbirds. So, all this is, is complex, because naturally lots has been written about the longbirds. It's one of the most important chapters in the migration era, say, all over continental or anglosphere, historiography. If you have a, not an idea of how much has been written, it, it's, it's mastodontic, it's infinite. You can't barely dominated in a lifetime, right? But until so, lots has been written in this through this model, through for example toponomastic inquiries that however are sometimes led with no expertise whatsoever and that just by themselves is also just quite controversial. What do you mean? That just there is a place that bears the name of this and without much of another Evidence. What one thing is is knowing, you know, the islands as we've seen in in the previous videos, it, it can be criticized in that way too. But let's say we know exactly the islands were settled. In some places, we find at very strategically and somehow isolated um, and equidistant. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, position certain places that still are called like Alan, Alain, whatever. Um, and the islands were a few, by the way. With the Longbirds, you have a massive invasion. It was essentially the largest in, in the migration era. Um, still within a sea of Romans, uh, this is true. And that, however, and that was scattered throughout more or less the entire peninsula, and that therefore hardly can simply mean per se because of a name that arrived to us later without much, like any. Um, idea whether at the time was called like that and it happened at the time of the Longbird conquest or not. Um, 
to 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 reassure right uh that um because it, it in this way you wouldn't criticize the old certainties right uh that the longbirds were settled in very specific places and in very specific places within the cities right and we know that because look at this name right and what we know about late 6th century is notoriously uh, an almost nothing whatsoever right so the, the thing is is crazy right um it's it's pseudo science first of all um so this could uh, spot even th this was the palace of this that king or that that's the palace of that duke and very often by the way there are there are things that are that you can't even quite dig in because you can't quite dig into uh, an Italian city because it, it's the single most stratified land in the in the world archaeologically and uh, literally like if you have if you want to to dig somewhere you have to destroy what what is there d different layers. Um, uh, by the way, this this uh, this is all. It's also a matter of priority. Who does found, for example, a research for longer stuff as opposed to Roman one. Uh, it, it's really a mess in many ways because lots of people from from abroad just take this place in Italy say they have to find the Roman stuff because they told they gave it a, a budget and maybe they find a, a 7th century wall there that could be extremely precious to understand so many things but they destroy it and they illegally even hide that to local authorities because they they fear to lose their money right and uh, these people are criminals like I I would advocate actually for shooting them on the spot but apparently that would be illegal as well so you know but uh, there can be a a fair in between that um reality is a completely different matter right uh serious studies have exhaustively demonstrated how the development of byzantine and longbird cities was practically the same. In other words, all the stories, you see this name, because in the Legion of the Place, uh, this was the name, whatever, it was this, that, the longer bird settled there, that, they changed, they, 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 they lived in a couple of different ways from the Romans, uh, this was so different, it made such a difference. You study the archaeology of Byzantine and Longobard cities, and you find the same identical pictures. Now, this is very interesting, right? Um, and there is, again, a, you say, but how can there be a difference? Well, of course, there are differences in as much as we're talking about different areas and things like that. But in terms of, let's say, this city, this bunch of cities as under the Longbird, say, developed with common extraneous characteristics to the ones of the Byzantines has not brought anywhere. The late Longbird occupation of Cosa and Luni is another alarming uh, bell, let's say, that makes you wary against the plausibility of such sort of ethnic um, lodgings, settlements, whatever. All right, it's it's been now. You see, you see what are these are things that occurred in more relative, uh, say more, say relatively later times uh, somehow, and they had to insist on this concept, right? That there was this difference because multiculturalism. Yes, it did make this, and you understand how that fuels as uh, a leftist ideology. Actually, the same ethno-nationalism against any evidence that we can collect, right? So there is no doubt that, for example, many of these huts were found and others will be found still, and that in many cases someone will delude themselves to have found the longer birds, right? But it's even um, uh, less uh, uh, in doubt that when you try to make this this mechanism it doesn't actually uh explain anything per se uh the 
explanation of how the Longbirds first settled is not evidenced by any of these sources, both in the city or in the territory. Um, they are dumb. Archaeology is fundamentally dumb, right? It doesn't tell you anything. There is not a tag on it. You do not know practically anything. Um, you know zero about the context, uh, and unless you're lucky for history to actually explain you something, and it's, of course, uh, even just statistically unsatisfactory, because you will never find uh, even a remotely satisfactory quantity uh, of, of, this, um, of this evidence to explain how it entirely was at the time, and who built the stuff, and how, and why, and, you know, you, you will never have the face of the guy that that built that hut. Um, so, again, utter wasted uh, money, work, and time for not being able to read history in a more intelligent way. One certain thing we have, though, cities, again, maintained their centrality to say the least, in the kingdom founded by the Longbirds. So again, doesn't matter that the crisis of the, the broader migration era, at least as far as Italy was concerned, went on uh, still during the end of the 6th century. The Longbirds installed in the cities the centers of their political power. You can't say the new political power because the Italian political power had always been in the cities, uninterruptedly, and would remain uninterrupted. However, considering the great difficulties in urban archaeology that we highlighted, and again, it's not easy to simply reconstruct what happened through that, to say the least, it's almost useless, uh, and, and due especially to the extremely strong continuity in the Italian settlements. So, picture this, the, the entire contrast with, again, ah, oh, this place was deserted because there had been the war and the plague, it was nothing. All this place, there was nobody, it was scattered, like, there was almost like a few millions inhabitants. Was the, you see this continuity throughout the entire time. Again, it, demographics is a bit the same as archaeology, right? If not even worse. We do not understand much, if not when you start realizing what was happening historically there. People want to find um, the magic trick with a, a pair of numbers to explain violently complicated things that they're just too dumb to even try to, to make the, the effort as the lazy asses that they are to make sense on the basis of actually building up a, a personal culture, right? And so they have to start m creating these strange machinations in a completely abstract reality that they do not understand, they do not know, uh, because also they never learned of it, um, and pretending, again, that things are the way they want, even though you have just simply by reading uh, a basic long about history, like the, the, the pretty good idea of what was going on, right? Consider this, that about, for example, these settlements outside the cities that notoriously in Italy, uh, differently from places like France or Germany, there was no center, was, I'd say, no settlement, no community that was separated from the city. Right? In Central Europe, you find things like the world of the forest. There are literally woodsmen that inhabit as communities within the forest, very far away from cities. They do not hear of it. They do not trade with that. Um, in, even in post-Roman Europe, uh, in Italy, there is no such thing. Right? Everything revolves, like the entire countryside revolves around the city. Right? So, interestingly enough, what you see is that the majority of uh, the uh, say archaeological finds attributed to the Longbirds and used normally to reconstruct the settlement of the invaders are to be found in this broader area. Um, this makes you think that 
uh, especially also the funerary finds of longer bird times are important to investigate because traditionally it's been given um, an interpretation of the settlements that would have been revealed by the graves um, uh, highlighting the say presumable or presumed strategic character for example of certain specific I don't know roads for example road axes um, this has in part some sense but it's not clear like it's not just because you find graves scattered um, next to again important um, centers on the roads etc that, that simply means that again that numerically or statistically is so relevant I mean graves at some point were looted were uh, taken away were uh, you know things change landscape changes settlements change uh, evolution like the Drisa say look at Europe as such think about all the castles that existed in Europe how much do you see of that we're talking about hundreds of castles even in um, uh, hundreds of uh, squared kilometers right how much do you see that of that right and there are people who presume say oh look there are so many castles in that country that's somehow more medieval and when I think about medieval history I think mostly about that country while the most advanced country that destroyed castles because at the time of course they were replaced by more advanced structures and because they were they were more developed they had more money whatever that means that it doesn't have a medieval history because it's uh, it doesn't look medieval enough to the average dumb t tourist so um, here is a bit the same dynamic first of all one other concept I think is useful to address the topic that is there's never been found yet in Italy any trace whatsoever or, or hint etc of Longobard settlements autonomous from the Roman population reflect on this right the the entire notion that again the Longbirds would have settled in a sort of paranoid way maybe within the Romans but separated from there is completely without evidence right there is not a single instance in which you can look at that and say well you know it's evident here the Romans leave it here and the Longbirds there there is no evidence and not just in Italy but also in Pannonia for example there is no evidence of that nobody can say that uh, there's no way to, to see it um, this is something that we literally came up as ourselves say in the 19th century and in the 20th century on the base of no evidence whatsoever uh, there is a complete um, and total silence of archaeological and written sources about the dynamics of the longer settlement think about it there are lots of pictures you can find on the internet says oh look here it's all the graves that have been found of these people uh, and then you know of course from history that they settled pretty much everywhere and you say but why did we find just I don't know certain a this stuff concentrated in certain areas uh, and you can guess sometimes but uh, that obviously hasn't to do with the demographic density all can be about just even how who decides to dig where and how right and it's not as enormously scattered thing I mean one thing is filling a map with every single thing you can think it's traceable to the, to a long bird and that will look oh so many points but it's not really I don't know the actual telling you anything about the actual pattern of the settlement across the entire peninsula of course there are some indicators like there are better or worse um, takes on it we can even trace some even genetically some of this right which is uh, fascinating right um, there is just a mean that is the aforementioned upon a mastic that uh, has however only apparently filled this void meaning um, that of course um, Italy is full of toponyms of Germanic origin right that became famous also surnames as uh, and whatever uh, but toponyms fix themselves on on a very long time right they become part of the land the culture the, the, the language whatever um, because of many dynamics there are cer certain surnames for example that are just 
sort of clientry uh, patronymics of some sort. Which means that you were a Roman, let's assume, but you were within the, I don't know, you were a serf of uh, a longbird at some point, and you had been, uh, you know, freed or and or uh, you you belonged now under a lot in different centuries, not necessarily on longer times, and you were eventually named like that, right? Consider that, especially surnames, like at some point did not even exist. Uh, this developed just in the high middle ages fundamentally and just for the most important people and so on. So it, it's very complex and even the, the, the name of the places um, are somehow controversial, especially when they're so scattered across the entire country. Uh, naturally, the most famous n names connected with a Longobard settlement um, are Fara, Sala, Arimania. Uh, these are the Far and Zal, Herman, etc. You know, it, it's the, you know, the, 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 they all mean different things. Uh, the first one, especially connected with the settlement, the second with sort of establishment, and a whole like, and uh, the Arimania refers to the sort of idea. Again, we we do not know exactly, but the sense that this was a community of free men in arms. They may have been a colony of some sort, but again, we do not know anything about this from written sources how it developed how those names remained at the beginning and even more how they be became attached to that specific territory that specific community during the millennia um, so this again it's been all because they, they were terms this is the most important thing that were used and uh, they're obviously um, they were not used before the Longbirds came in but having entered the local dialects were eventually also conferred to certain settlements that maybe I, I don't know were founded centuries later, you know, because Arimanus in Italy would remain juridically something uh, centuries later, for example. And so, uh, what is that, for example, in the eighth century or in the tenth? Right. It, it's quite important to to point out. Uh, so that's and we. Again, it's all undocumented. We just have the name today on a map. We can't trace back really the history of this place, especially up to that far, to, to, to the same long of our times. You can do it, of course, to, I don't know, the 12th century. If you're lucky, it depends, right? Uh, if, if you find this place mentioned in a source, whatever, but... Uh, we don't have that completion, right? Um, so this indicator is also ephemeral as far as the, the the proof, the alleged proof of some Longberg settlement per se, right? Um, again, the uh, the Longbirds were not so many compared to the rest of the population, and when when you look, for example, at uh, some places in Lombardy. That of course is, takes the name after the Longobards. For example, in the district of Monza, that is just next to Milan, and is one of the most studied, by the way, because there is also this point: who does study this thing? How much does it take to cover the entire picture? That alone can shift somehow the, the balance of this understanding. You would find allegedly five or six villages founded by the Longbirds. Um, and if you count, again, how few the Longbirds were overall, doesn't matter how more concentrated in, Longa, uh, in, Lombardy, in Lombardy they would have been, and probably not so much. I mean, the Longbirds were likely, say, had a greater demic impact on more fringe areas, right? The Long Lombardy was called as, uh, like, like as the, the land of the Longbirds because... That's where they placed their capital, where there were the most important cities, but also in that sense where there were the most Romans, you know. Um, so the fact that uh, through this toponomastic inquiry it would count in a place like the, the Monzais district, it is very small, like five or six Longobard villages allegedly founded by them just on the basis of, of, of the name uh, of the place seems... Uh, ridiculous. Um, 
right? There are surely many places in Israel, especially in, not in the Northeast or the Apennine, that in terms of ethnic impact of the Longbirds were much more Longbird, and maybe they have very Roman names uh, sometimes, right? There is, don't get me wrong, there are traces, like uh, even, in, for example, the, the toponym of the the names refer to the dogs, to the wolf, right? The idea of the wolf at Nars, etc. There is some of that, especially in northeastern Italy. You understand that they likely derive from that period. Um, but that's just because you don't see any valid, uh, say, alternative to that. Because we would call that stuff like that if there hadn't been that influence uh, otherwise. And compared to the broader culture around. So, such toponomastic instrument could be used for so many places in Italy, right? And, in fact, historiography, especially the local one, tended to do it, right? Saying if, if there is a local story of a town during the Middle Ages, you see, ah, this place was called Fara, so we know that the Longobards settled there because that's the place that... Uh, we don't have any information about, I don't know, Longobard times, but that from the 13th century we can document it. We can document called as Farah. And what the hell did happen in half of a millennium? And who does tell you that? that surely Longobards settled in, all over in a sort of capillary way, but how uh, impactful could they be to actually maintain the name of the place in the very moment they settled? Again, it, it's easier to think that even though some of these settlements were surely founded by Longobards, or at least came to be in that context, they were given this name because the Longobard names just entered in Italian language, and as such, they were this, these places were called. I would like to stress that, um, and I know it because I know people who study early medieval archaeology, that um, you think that we more or less know, for example, how many not just villages, towns, but especially cities there were, I don't know, in, in places like, I don't know, early medieval Italy. We do not know anything, almost, right? Uh, we have an idea of the major centers, but we know some instances of entire cities that were actually found, even recently, that were quite active and prosper throughout the early Middle Ages, and that form exactly within this limbo between, say, late antiquity and high middle ages that we think, oh my god, this was this terrible time, whatever. And we find literally um, entire centers that we completely ignore that basically reveal, say, make it oblige us to, to rewrite the entire history of, of the local province because they were that important and we somehow didn't even suspect that there, there would be. And you can imagine, especially in such an intensely populated and archaeologically stratified country like Italy, how much of that there is. I mean, we do have scholarly an idea, but it wouldn't take, I think, the entire money of, of, of the European Union to effectively dig out everything that there is there. Uh, and basically, I mean, as Westerners, at least as Europeans, we, we sit on a massive amount of wealth that we could make Europe ex exclusively an open-air museum and nothing else. This is what I've always believed. We, we do not need anything else, ideally, of course. Um, if, if we concentrated everything on the actual civilization that, that we have and the actual historical cultural legacy that we have. Right? Um, think about this when you watch junk... Uh, history uh, videos on YouTube and nobody gives a damn about these things um, because these are the great tragedies in the history of mankind right um, the fact that nobody even cares at all so when you look at the entirety of Longobard toponyms present in Italy you would have to account millions of Longobards if you wanted to attach to them the, them, the, the, the foundation of this very settlement in that time, right? And mostly, as you understand, even more na and more narrowly to the same moment of, of the migration that lasted some, say, it was in f 568, other large numbers probably entered the year later that were surely other groups moving later, but mostly it's those years.
right? So we would all have uh, a tapestry of uh, names that are all surely the vestige of the Longobard settlement, even though we do not know anything else <laughs> comparatively in scale about the period. Uh, I'm sure we should go by that, right? This is not exactly the thing. I mean, if, if the Longobards, that would be the dream. If they had been millions, they would have literally uh, wiped out the Byzantines, would probably reconquered the entire Roman Empire uh, alone, right? Who were that size. Of course, there weren't those people uh, available in the first place. And uh, some places in Central Europe did depopulate because of still the, the pretty impressive number of that that migrated from there. Then the Slavs usually filled a bit, you know, the the gap. Um, so um, we have thus to be very serious about uh, uh, the entire way we see. Uh, we're trying to reconstruct the Longobard settle, and especially in attaching somehow the strategic military meaning to it. Uh, at least for what we can see. Of course, we have an idea of what they would have preferably done. There is no doubt that some strategic locations were occupied by the Longobards. But because it's logical, not because we have an evidence of it. Right? So there is, of course, a divide between the two things. Um, surely, uh, in the first period, uh, the strategic uh, needs were predominant. This is fair to say. Yet when you look at the 7th century, when still the Longbirds were still invading a central Byzantine territory, conquering at this point properly from, from a kingdom, right, as with regular forces, let's say, um, the, um, you have to consider that this mechanism was happening in a moment in which the merging between the Romans and the Germans had already gone quite ahead by themselves right so at that point saying well this place was conquered or founded by the Longobards at that time so these were Longobards and saying well look at this funerary find or uh, let's identify it as a, a, a Germanic individual the question is what the hell does it even mean Right, they they were already at the time very much uh, operating as we will see uh, jointly, and uh, there is no doubt there was a cultural, there was a Germanization of the Italian customs, and obviously uh, even more in in, in the Longobard controlled air. But that's exactly the point: were these Longobards, and especially at that late, was this the, the pattern of settlement or was the the pattern of conquest of populations mostly were already there and were ruled by. Uh, surely the descendants of, of the of the Longobards of the first hour, but that were also cited by pretty large amounts of, of Ro Romans were now Germanized, essentially. In, in name, because these people spoke Latin at that point, or Romance languages, at least, that uh, were uh, essentially uh, now what the Longobards would have come to spoke bitterly. Um, this doesn't mean naturally that uh, we can't identify some specific castra, for example, in the and especially in northern Italy, uh, at, at the frontiers, in the Alpine chain, of course, where most uh, of them would can be easily identified also because they were had been part of the old Tractus Italia Circa Alpes of late antiquity. Of course, uh, the Roman uh, fortifications had uh, remained uh, as as a as a very complex system of so-called in-depth defense uh, throughout all the the Gothic times, the, the Longobard times. The problem, though, is that we're talking again about castra, so not massive fortresses and such castles are thus not easily identifiable they were just made of wood uh, and, and dirt and all this stuff so um, 
they, they have to be dug. Uh, it's not that uh, certain you will necessarily find anything again the, the same Roman uh, maps, let's say, whichever information we, we get, say maps, it's a big word, Romans use the itineraria, but let's say, again, that's, that's not a satellitary image, so um, it, it's, again, archaeology. Uh, we also have another problem, that is, these castra were not necessarily at this point part of a broader strategic defense. They were not part of a net that now was seen as, okay, now as Longobard Kingdom we control directly uh, with garrisons all the system and basically we're just watching uh, for anybody who, who gets through or whatever. Of course uh, everything was somehow decentralized, uh, autonomous in many ways, uh, these weren't times of major invasions in the first place, so obviously the kingdom did control some of these fortresses, they had troops they could send uh, in case of need, but uh, again, th there's no such thing like even the resources to have a permanent force station to, to maintain upkeep, by the way it is these fortresses and so on, it would occur as the local, local dukes, for example, were interested in strengthening their own territorial control, so they would invest in the restructuring of such buildings, etc. But um, it was mostly entrusted to them as a, by the king as a broader task, and that they would have just uh, uh, pursued anyway but by themselves. So it's all less uh, regular. This is typically normal uh, for for Romano-Germanic times in the first place and again the most important thing was to have an army not to have fortresses here and there. They could help but armies get through anyway if you don't bring another army right and you can also build some fortifications ad hoc whenever the problem arises. Consider the Franks had the upper hand um, uh, in uh, northwestern Italy on the Alpine uh, watershed, so much so that even still the, the the modern frontier between Italy and France is uh, unbalanced from the side of France. Um, from 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 the migration era, conversely, the Longobards had the upper hand on the Danube Valley. They were stronger than the Bavarians and they controlled, they had more ammon posts from, from the side of the Danube as opposed from the side of the Po. So this tells you also how relatively fluid this frontiers really were and how of course there were, was plenty of castles overall. There, there was a, a centralized net of control but it was deputed to, to the local communities mostly. Right? Even there were uh, river uh, river patrols, right? Uh, the, the boatmen who uh, worked for the king for passage, etc., were tasked with uh, the the control of who crossed or not. There were people who could escape for not being, say, uh, sent in in the army or but think, things like this. These were essentially police functions that you find in all the Romano-Germanic kingdoms. And we know this because from the later centuries we do have a lot of info, right? We just do not know as far as the, the 6th century settlement how this was going in detail. Probably not very differently, by the way, because nothing drastically changed in the history of civilization at the time. So, uh, that's normally how these things worked. Um, and even more favorable cases uh, for, let's say, trying to identify an early Longobard settlement uh, in, for example, the famous and large cemeteries of Nucera Umbra and Castel Trusino, referring, by the way, to two castra placed uh, to guard uh, respectively the Via Flaminia and the Via Salaria uh, 
are not so easily and readily you know, just identifiable in that first context. At least only Nocera, according to at least the most updated archaeological analysis, belong to a definitely militarized community, uh, uh, as it's been revealed f uh, from the relation between the essentially the age classes of the dead in, in, the, in the cemetery. Uh, as much as the wealth uh, of displayed and by their armament, right? So you you can't think in that case we we got it right. We have surely a this this avant-post of, of the Flaminian road is close to the Byzantine boundary, and there is, we know that there were wars, clashes, raids, etc. We find this massive cemetery which that does date more or less around those first times, but not only because this this continue over uh, over a certain period of time and the people buried there are even at least some sort of militarized group that has that function has that lifestyle that he's tasked likely also by some higher power to, to be there in the first place it's obvious that the true frontier fortresses, at least from the Longbird side, had to be uh, relatively modest also in the 8th century. Uh, this because of what we said before. Uh, there was no way for even a powerful entity like the Longbird Kingdom, that by the end of the 7th century, by the time of the disgregation of Merovingian power, was objectively the largest uh, Latin Germanic power at, at the time. So they they had, a again, a stable power, etc., but they didn't have, again, the, re the necessary resources to invest um, profitably in some sort of permanent garrison, right? Uh, at least that could control the entire frontier. Think about the entire Alpine arc, let's say, uh, or even in the south with, with the Byzantines, with, with the Pope. It, it, it's not much of a thing. Again, most of this uh, balance rested on the internal cohesion of the kingdom that could levy troops in case of need. So while there would be settlements that had historically developed in the frontier areas and as such were likely more militarized than the others we cannot spot uh, thick permanent garrisons surely there was some of that um, uh, but we do not have uh, the evidence specifically we can't just think it's plausible but the most important thing in that in Longobard Italy there was no such thing like a permanent army right there was at least an ad hoc force as the general levy just like you know Romano-Germanic systems um, and there wasn't much of a threat at this point nobody after the the early 7th century threatened uh, Italy significantly Right, the, the Franks were engulfed in their clashes. Mostly, the Abers harassed the uh, the Austrian Longobards, that is, the ones inhabiting in northeastern Italy, also causing severe damage. But there was the entire uh, I don't know duchies, say of Friuli, etc., that uh, resisted against the Abers, and surely there was a coordination with Pavia and all this stuff. But again. The fact that somebody in arms would inhabit there was, was enough to provide for defense. Uh, so, again, we don't have to go that far to admit that we don't know anything about the early Longbird settlement in detail, mm -hmm. geographically, precisely, and how the Longbirds would manage this in Con concretely, right? In from a strategic point of view, I mean, in, through military administration as the kingdom developed, uh, etc. Uh, the aforementioned Nocera Umbra is, uh, in, in, you know, in the uh, Apenninic heartland, is one of the few uh, relatively certain and well-studied cases 
of a sort of military colony with a community tied to the castrum that, in that case, by the way, didn't count more than 70, 80 people, by the way. So we're not talking about immense forces, just a sort of handful of somehow specialized troops that uh, lived in a condition of colony. Like this, if you study Roman history, for example, you know how, so through the videos we've made on, on the conquest, uh, of Italy in the early times like the idea of simply sending somebody to leave on the frontier was enough because there were freemen in arms and that, that's technically how the Roman colonies had been born here the, the longbirds were doing essentially the same in a place that again offered as we were saying before some infrastructure and lots of points uh, d'appui right in all this what the hell do we know about the quantities involved in the blending? Uh, let's say, the, however, this, again, we don't know about the smaller settlements. We have even problems in interpreting, in an ethnic sense, the funerary uh, goods, right? We, we may think these are actual ethnic longbirds. Are we sure of that? Because it's it's not entirely clear. You 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 could find uh, aside from the fact that these were not just longbirds at the time. There were uh, Thuringians, uh, Franconians, Swabians, whatever. But the 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 Italians began to be equipped in in the same ways. Uh, that this was a process in material culture just followed from from the actual picture and. Again, also the anthropometric differences are somehow negligible. History is not made by, I don't know, these people were, I don't know, two meters tall and the Italians were 160 centimeters, right? They more or less look the same. And just in certain cases, you look at massive people and you say, well, maybe, like, if there is some statistical uh, data on the basis of which you can identify the average, you can say maybe these are more likely belonging to this other group but otherwise it's uh, it's complicated and really Europeans weren't that different in height I don't know why people think this still today frankly if you look at the Italian population it's, they're not actually short um, uh, short people as the, the difference is just in a few inches from northern and southern Europe and especially Italians are somehow taller than the average southern European so uh, that that's also fascinating because surely that uh, happened because of other northerners that settled in the peninsula. If you think about the, the gods, again, the longbirds, the Normans, other people from, kept arriving, by the way, throughout the whole Roman Empire from Germany. We've documented it very often, just talking, for example, about the Duchy of Spoleto in that video I made a couple of... Uh, months ago, but we have seen it, that first the Longbirds, then this place remained always settled by people sent from Germany with all their retinues, whatever. They may have not been that significant, but we still see uh, in um, places around, for example, the same Spoleto or, or Benevent, that there is a higher percentage of people with blonde hair, blue eyes. Not much more than the average, like a, a 5% more uh, and uh, so it's negligible considering we're talking about tens uh, of points percentage uh, and uh, so uh, the, the, there was there all the Italicum Sustratum, at some point the Celtic one, I mean this, this is another thing but in general right, that's as few as we can say as a general approximation Consider that there were lots of Byzantine objects in Longbird tombs during the late 6th and in the 7th century. This is obvious because, as we will see now, we remember before regarding the urban development, uh, that's a point that you always have to make. This was not like one, la one part of Italy was like Germany, one part of 
Italy was like Greece. This was Italy <laughs> as a wall. And uh, the Longobard Italy and Byzantine Italy looked pretty damn similar. There isn't a major civilizational rift that you have to come into uh, the scene to explain the deep differences about it. But that was essentially a continental, like a, a, a strong Italic core. Like it, it was, like a deeply Romanized land that basically had just some uh, islands of... Uh, of Greek speakers in some communities in the major coastal cities of, of the south um, and uh, some other but scattered like that that were absolutely mi uh, minor. You may have had a longer bird, say, uh, ethnicity that somehow sided with Mostly the area that was formerly Celtic in nature, but it also, uh, you know, even at that point, they were talking about Celticized populations and also heavily Romanized populations. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much it. Like the Longbirds basically take over the entire interland. Right? The, the Byzantine presence at some point remains negligible, even as a, uh, even considering that that could have been like. Uh, so a sort of external, say, foreign influence that would have altered the local, the local culture. Uh, overall, contrarily to this, what is commonly said, Italy always had a pretty compact and unitary uh, ethnic background that, especially, increased over time. Also because there weren't any major invasions. Again, this is something that was thought in the 19th century too, that, uh, say, uh, social Darwinists and, and racists had to explain why and how, you know, Italians as darker people could have Rome if only racial purity, um, phenotypic, you know, uh, fairness was, uh, was the hallmark of civilization. And so they had to invent that during the Middle Ages, the Saracens somehow raped, I don't know, one-third of the Italian population to explain why, why they're dark. Um, the Italian population remained substantially unchanged since Roman times, right? The, the Longobards were the last big and yet still mi very minority injection that you can demographically sustain, like, say, you know, all the... From the, the demographic output of the peninsula, this is what essentially molded it to the end. Um, but you must fight even against these things to to actually explain the story, because otherwise, uh, again, everything becomes a meme on the base of hearsay. Who's hearsay? On the basis of what? On the basis of what evidence? On the basis of what actual major microscopical historical notion that is not just a sort of childish fantasy made up for comforting your own uh, insecurity. Because I can't see any other reason. Consider that the interaction, of course, between Byzantine Italy and Longobard Italy was intense. We know that typical objects in the funerary, uh, among the funerary ones of the Longobard tombs were fabricated in Rome and exported in the territory of the kingdom. That Rome that had fallen, that had disappeared, um, and that wasn't basically the single uh, major scholar and challenged beacon of light throughout the entire Western Christendom uh, that was evangelizing coordinately uh, up to with, with, you know, the Celtic fringe, the entire Western continent that was, you know, connected with the entire course that was understood as the, the major spiritual um, institution all over the West, and basically not even Constantinople could deny it, etc. Yes, that Rome, that Rome that you just want to see how how it went depopulated, because, I don't know, you have to, to dramatize the fall of Rome uh, as the only thing that matters, and is and basically neglecting this whole thing that was actually happening. Uh, if you look at the excavations at the Crypta Balbi, you will see that quite clearly. We find the same stuff that we find 
in the Longbird Graves. Uh, and that is also fascinating because again it's the same country it's, it's a it's a few not even a few hundreds of kilometers we've seen how deep the the actual interaction between the Papacy and the Longbirds actually was also on a peaceful and friendly ground by the way so the so the myth of the Longbirds constantly awaiting for seizing Rome and for, for some sort of uh, religious tension that never existed by the way uh, because it was never used even in the moment in the few relatively few moments of conflict with the papacy nobody really understand where what it should have been there is definitely uh, a byzantine style in longobard aristocracy as well that's obvious i mean the byzantine empire was enormous still in spite of the fact that it ha was literally halfened by the by the Arab invasions, which was also a reason why the Byzantines gave up on Italy, and at this point they had much more serious uh, problems to deal with at home. Um, so when we still watch this graves and we say, "Oh well, this is typically ethnic Longobard," what what the hell is that exactly? You know, did did you meet? Uh, with a person in flesh uh, that you have the skeleton of and you ask them what, what who they were, where their parents were, what they believed in, what was their identity. You know, that would be really interesting. But unfortunately, uh, we we don't know it. There is no, uh, again, even racially, anthropometrically, we do not see differences. We, there is no scientific admission of an actual divide between the two systems you could of course th there have been of course dna t tests and there is in fact a lot of interesting stuff coming out of that and there is while there is definitely uh, a connection we find mm, some long birds had definitely slavic blood there's a great proximity with some polish samples for example there are lots of proximities even with the anglo-saxon with modern britain because of course there were some longer birds that in part remained in germany and that eventually migrated with the saxons to the british isles so you could see of course that there were romans that already had germanic ancestry from centuries and how do you distinguish exactly that uh, on the basis of, let's say, well, even just on a s statistical basis from such graves, right? Don't be fooled by DNA, because the DNA t tests reveal really, really a lot, telling the truth, and very often way more uniform pictures than we think. The problem is, again, how many finds do you have? Of course, the more those increase and the more the, the say the, the the matches are and the more that works that way, but it's still s somehow controversial in, in terms of scientific method to just pick a bunch of these samples and thinking of populations of millions and try to to say, well, this were these guys. It's a bit complicated to say the least. There is another uh, concept, of course, which is regarding the 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 elite, right, of the new kingdom. That surely was, in good part, constituted by people of Germanic ancestry, but that again was quickly mixed with, with the others. And when you look at these graves and you find again a militarized aristocracy, well, there, there's nothing strange to think that these were Romans, right? At least there, there were natives that now considered themselves Longbirds, but that were not perhaps in part even descending from the group that invaded Italy in the 6th century. For example, the Swords were 
of course, the, the, the primary uh, symbol of supremacy. I made lots of videos about swords, I will keep making them. Uh, just like the saddle, that is the saddles of Roman tradition. I can't stress this enough. Again, the uh, citizenry, especially living in the cities, and we know it very well from epigraphy, kept on having an incredible sense of their own uh, prestige throughout the entire early Middle Ages. Again, you can't trace that sense of municipalism of this house, that family living in that city that had that administrative tasks, uh, were those magistrates, etc. From the, the late antiquity, I'd say the late antique um, uh, honors, right, to the uh, late communal magistracies. And, you know, they were all militarized. They were boasting the fact that they were strong because they had retinues, because they had clientels, because they had arms, right? So this Roman military symbols are, of course, very much in tune with the military symbols that the Longobards bring. And so given that this land would become the kingdom of the Longobards, and after all, it was important to be a Longobard, ethnically speaking, just to access uh, all the charges. What I mean ethnically, I mean juridically, of course. Um, of course, you had to jump in. You know, and the names, Edom, uh, etc. When you look at the elites of the late antique West, since the end of the 4th century, by the way, that's as early as it happened, you realize that there is an accentuation of the military traits that are emphasized thanks to, again to the aforementioned epigraphies and eventually the actual graves with arms. So the fact that again uh, also the, the long birds arrived uh, took over this population was somehow entirely spent by the millennia of conquest that Rome had carried out to now simply succumb to the Germans I wouldn't deny it's it, it has something to it, but it's something that still was reinvigorated through the same people by the long birds, right? So that, uh, especially again, the, the elite, the, the concept of an, uh, a military aristocracy is something that, of course, speaks in the entire early medieval language, right? And you were a long bird if you, at some point, were accepted as such. And we will see how this, this happened, very rapidly, by the way. And surely the dominant values of the society of the long bird kingdom were deriving from that sense of universal warfare that we explain countlessly in the imperial Catholic tradition, so that the long birds were, on the basis of this, uh, augmenting also the pre-existing uh, warlike physiognomy of the uh, Italian aristocracy. We don't have also to think again of this sense of the Longbirds being purely warriors uh, for so long uh, after they settled, meaning, of course, they were a people in arms, and being an armed freeman would always remain very important. But once they settled in Italy, they also had to organize this world, had to make it work administratively. Uh, of course, the Romans would heavily contribute to it. Uh, just think about, I don't know, how they wrote the Edictum Rotary uh, to, in Latin to the Longobard people that obviously at that point had also become the, essentially the majority of the Italian population in the mechanism that we just explained. We see, of course, among the Romans and among the Germans different levels of freedom, so that uh, the Longbirds entered Italy already with half freemen, with slaves, with different, uh, again, price for, for the individual. Um, this thing was true 
also in the Roman world. So there is, uh, just to complicate the matter, at least if you were to make a, a, ph a photography, a picture uh, of, of this, like uh, how does this interplay? We, we unfortunately have a, a very few information, say certain information about this in order to explain the whole thing. So that's why we need to make all these videos uh, in the first place. What we can affirm is that in the, by the 7th century, so just essentially a couple of generations after the Longbird settlement, the picture was already very different. And it was the picture of a successful as fast integration between the two systems. Right, integration in the actual sense, meaning that the Longbirds were as we've seen, a staunch minority, but the majority of, of at least of the Romans, of the free Romans, were essentially at least becoming longbirds themselves, um, so that the, the minority had succeeded in winning over culturally this people, for reasons that we will explain, as much as this people was essentially still making up the, the bulk of, of the Longbird Kingdom, as Longbirds now, right? So this is, um, uh, let's say, the most important picture of all, I would say, right? There is, um, we will talk about the crucial uh, changes that occur at this point, mostly the establishment of the Kingdom and especially the Edictum of Rotary, because before that, um, is, uh, you know, we, we also know relatively few how the system worked concretely again. We will talk about how the Roman and the Germanic cultures changed during the 7th century um, in Italy, and so how the whole thing really went. But there is a lot, really, to, to talk about regarding uh, Longobard history, because, um, again, it goes very, uh, very much to the advantage of anyone who has uh, interest, in, of course, in the migration era first, but also in the development of the, say, European identities, because the, at least the case of the Longbirds in Italy is also quite, is making up for also lots of the, of the, of the lack of evidence for other countries. Right, and consider that we're extremely lucky in that, in that sense. Longbird society was definitely different to some degree of, from some of the others, but definitely the level of documentation is higher than elsewhere. And in general, the, like, especially Germanistics, for Germanistics, I mean, the, the Longbird, Longbird law is basically the single most important Germanic body of of juridical sources right there is no doubt about this if you want to understand what germanic societies actually were you must study the edictum uh, there are so many great works even dated ones if you want to start with Mozaleski, for example or uh like there are of course lots of italian but but german like the, the longer birds really uh remained in the hearts of all these people because for obvious reasons, but primarily because of this preeminence in importance uh, for especially the juridical side of the story. That is, of course, is revealing at this, uh, this point because you can't track basically any other dynamic otherwise. Uh, but like through through that, so right, the, everything has to to end up there. Um, all right, uh, we will again keep talking about Longbirds, hopefully for today. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.